Well, you have to go back to the 1800s when the policy of the United States government was to eradicate the Indian culture, Indian, Indian way of life from America to turn us into two-bit facsimiles of the white man. They have devised many programs, but uh, the previous generation to mine suffered the most at the hands of this genocidal program where they were not permitted to speak our native language. It was against the law to practice our, uh, our religion to even dance or sing in Indian. Anything Indian was condemned and punishable. And then it developed a program of forcing us off the reservation. There's many ways of doing this, of course, economic deprivation. Uh, therefore, we were forced into the cities to look for uh, jobs for existence. Then they introduced the relocation program where they relocated Indian people from reservations to seven different designated cities in the United States. After the first five years of my life, first six or seven, I then began growing up in the urban environment. And I have yet to meet an Indian. In, an, in the urban environment that does not plan on eventually going home. Going home is, is to the concentration camp where we come from, which the white man in this country terms a reservation. It is indeed a concentration camp and a zoo rolled into one. But there is a very vast difference between reservation Indian people who have grown up and stayed on the reservation and those Indians that have gone off into the urban areas. The difference is, is on the reservation where the traditional life, even though it had to go underground to, to maintain, to exist, and now it is beginning to surface. But there you have the benefit of your people, out in the districts, out on the land. And you learn patience, you learn, you learn the value system of being a red man of the Western Hemisphere. You are in close touch with Mother Earth and all the traditional beliefs and all the traditional people, especially the old people who are so important to our existence as the red men of the Western Hemisphere. In the urban environment, to remain an Indian is like trying to swim upstream in rapids because of the totality, the comprehensive totality and weight that is surrounds you in the cities, the white man's ways. You see, an old man told me once that the hardest thing today is to be an Indian. Now, he did not mean racial discrimination. He did not mean uh, bias and prejudice. He did not mean uh, the white man's hate for us. What he meant was living the life of a traditional Indian in today's world. Today's world, it's too easy to be white. To be a white man, all you have to be concerned about is, is money and possessions and, and the pleasures, what he terms pleasures of life, when he doesn't realize that here is, lies the pleasure, the life that surrounds us, these green things which are our relatives, this grass, the things that grow are our relatives. That is life. That's beauty. The clouds, the, the universe, the birds, the four-leggeds, all living things which are our relatives. But the white man sees that he has to manipulate and exploit all these things so that he can, he can have pleasure, self-pleasure. It's, it's, it's complete selfishness. And so this is what that old man meant when the hardest thing today is to be an Indian, to get up with the morning star and pray at the time that the great mystery gave the two-legged the time to pray. You see, with the morning star, everything is quiet. All life has rested so that the two-legged can communicate with the great mystery. The birds are quiet. All life are, is asleep. Our Mother Earth 
is asleep. And so at this time in the morning is the time when we pray. As we have recognized that it is set aside for us at that point in time. The hardest thing to be an Indian is to go into the sweat lodge daily, to live the life of our ancestors. That's what he meant. Because it's so easy to be white. It's so easy to go out and get a job and become concerned only with money. And then you start building fences around your house. And you start building fences around your cities. And you start building fences around your states. You start building fences around your country. And all this time you're building only a fence around yourself. And that's the fault of the white man. He is by himself. He lives by himself. He has no relatives. He even goes so far as to leave the land of his ancestors, to leave the burial places of his forefathers. He has no respect, so he is isolated. The difference between the urban Indian and the reservation Indian is that the temptation to be selfish, the totality of that temptation is too much to fight against. And consequently, to live in the urban areas as I have done, is to, be, is to lose your Indianness, slow but sure. So this is why I chose to return home to the reservation, even though it is a concentration camp. My beautiful people are there, my old people, my religious leaders, my, my relatives, all that are still free. And so that is really the difference between urban and reservation Indian. I have a situation where it began in the urban area. Clyde Balcourt and Dennis Banks realized they were losing their Indianness. In fact, they, they, they looked at themselves and they said, why am I an Indian? And originally, AIM, of course, was organized to combat police brutality in Minneapolis, Minnesota. But it grew because the ideas of self-determination, the ideas of, of being able to stand on your own two feet, eye to eye with the white man, and say, wait a minute, stop. Yeah. 